Sí. Hola, buenos días a todos y gracias por venir. Es para mí un, un placer presentar una vez más a nuestro amigo eh, Yari Taskirin, que ha sido visitante en nuestras dos universidades de la ciudad de Valencia varias veces. Eh, Yari es un especialista en análisis funcional, análisis complejo y también en ecuaciones en derivadas parciales y eh, yo ha sido además coautor con, con varios de, de nosotros varias veces y mm, para mí es una alegría que en estos tiempos que corren vaya, haya podido venir a, a, a Valencia y darnos una charla. Yo creo que lo mejor es darle la palabra bienvenido, Yari, y muchas gracias por, por estar con nosotros. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction, and uh, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation, and, and Professor Bonnet also for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be in Valencia. Good mathematics, good landscape, good food, good, good climate, everything perfect. So, uh, on my talk, uh, you see the title here, Bergman Kernels and Projections on Periodic Planar Domains. Um, okay. So here is an abstract. Um, so we study Bergman kernels. Uh, it's uh, the integral kernel of Bergman projection. So we have a, a complex domain, a domain in the, the complex plane, which will be special in the sense that it will be periodic in one dimension. And then uh, we have the capital L2 space on that domain with respect to area measure, and uh, then we have uh, the subspace, closed subspace of analytic or holomorphic functions, and uh, uh, I mean, we will, we, we, we will be working in the Hilbert space case, so we have the orthogonal projection, and this is called the Bergman projection, uh, but it also has a representation, concrete representation as an integral operator with a kernel, and this kernel is, um, uh, you can write it down concretely if the domain is uh, symmetric uh, and it's important to, to know the kernel because uh, once you know then you can make uh, conclusions about for example the boundedness of the projection with respect to some other function spaces with other norms. By, by definition if of course the projection is bounded uh, in the Hilbert space case but to know about the other cases it would be extremely useful to, to know something about the kernel. And uh, now, uh, here we will assume something about uh, the domain, I mean this periodicity, but otherwise it may be rather irregular, so it means that the projection certainly can in general not be written uh, as a concrete function, uh, but it's, uh, as you will see, uh, I try to derive some new results about how the kernel looks like. And um, so the periodicity is, is the key property here. I've been working in uh, also in elliptic spectral problems which has nothing to do with Bergman spaces, very little to do with Bergman spaces. But here comes the main technical device, this Floquet transform, which is related to periodic domains and um, I'm trying to explain its use and uh, and you will see. Jerry, if you want to remove for the lecture, if you want to remove the, the mask. Yes, the yes, mask. if it is allowed, then, yes, for then the I will certainly the like to do that. Thank you very much. It helps. So, um, okay, here is uh, more or less what I already said. We have a domain in the complex plane and, and um, um, the Lebesgue-Hilbert space uh, with respect to the area measure and then the Bergman space A2 is uh, the corresponding subspace of analytic functions and then we have the orthogonal projection uh, and, and uh, as I said it, uh, it can be written as an integral operator I mean f to, to, to have this one does not really need very much about the, do the domain this is perfectly general thing uh, we have the Bergman kernel function which is an object of interest and uh, there are some general properties which always hold, namely that um, 
this uh, function as a function of um, z, it is an analytic function and we have this anti-symmetric property always. So these are classical known things. Um, okay, but what about the domain? Maybe we first have a look at this picture. So this is complex plane and uh, um, the real axis and imaginary axis then the periodicity, I put a periodic cell, which is this small pi here. It's situated between 0 and 1 uh, as regards to the real coordinate. And in the imaginary direction, I'm just assuming that it is bounded. And it should be a Lipschitz domain. Uh, I mean, we get uh, interesting enough examples, even in the case the boundary is C infinity smooth, but we can allow some, some non-smoothness. Uh, there could be corners, but uh, cusps are excluded. So uh, these are these are still corners here in this particular picture. So and uh, then uh, um, this is uh, the basic periodic cell, and it is just translated infinitely many times um, um, by adding an integer. So as according to this picture, uh, and and the full domain, this periodic domain, is this uh, denoted by capital pi. Uh, okay, this is a decent domain, and we have still this uh, L2 space on that domain, and 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 um, the Bergman space on that domain too. So here are the notations related to the previous picture. A periodic cell is denoted by small pi, and these are the translates, and the full domain is the interior of the union of the closures of the translated cells, and. Uh, uh, we make some assumptions so that uh, the polynomials uh, form a dense subspace here. Uh, one more thing, I will um, especially consider the case uh, when this domain is simply connected. So I, I think pi is simply connected if and only if small pi is. Uh, uh, I'm probably skipping some of the requirements here, but uh, in, in our case this will be true. Uh, moreover, if, if, if this periodic cell is um, say it is doubly connected, it has one hole, then of course the full domain is infinitely connected. So, so, so the main idea is try to do a kind of reduction of some things from the full domain, full periodic unbounded domain into the periodic cell. And uh, this might be useful uh, in, in the case um, the periodic cell is doubly connected and um, the full domain is infinitely connected because infinitely connected is much more complicated than doubly connected. So, um, okay, you will see. That was the picture. Uh, maybe I write something about um, um, let's, let's draw uh, maybe a bit more simple domain here on the blackboard, basically similar thing. So this is uh, the domain capital pi. And here is the small pi. And uh, I, I go for a moment back to the real world. I mean, talking about real variables. So this is x1 and x2. I, I just identify the complex plane with r2. So uh, x is now, x vector is the variable with two components. So the Floquet transform, it is here in the complex uh, formulation, but I, I would like to present uh, the original uh, formulation with, uh, in, in real variables. So f is assumed to be a function in L2 of capital Y. And then the Floquet transform, what does it do? Uh, so this is a function of the variable x vector. And the Floquet transform makes it where, where x is in originally in, in the capital pi. So the full domain is capital pi, the periodic domain. And uh, it makes the function f into a function of um, still a variable x vector, but uh, uh, this one will only live in the periodic cell. And in addition, we get a so-called Floquet parameter or quasi-momentum in the theory of periodic Schrodinger equations, uh, eta, which is in the interval minus pi to pi. And uh, the formula is a kind of, uh, I should say, a Fourier series. Um, namely, you somehow think that 
you have the point X here in the first periodic cell and look at the corresponding points in all periodic cells, you get a sequence which is to be understood as Fourier coefficients. And uh, then you make a Fourier series um, presentation of a function of eta like this. So here my vector x is only in the periodic cell small pi and eta is in, in the typical interval for, for Fourier uh, for functions is represented as Fourier series. So eta is in minus pi, interval minus pi to pi. So that's called the Floquet parameter or, or the quasi-momentum. And this is uh, the Floquet transform in the setting of, um, of um, say, Schrodinger equation or spectral electric problems or something like that. And, and its inverse transform um, is, uh, well, here is um, the formula for it also in the complex notation. But um, if, aha, so maybe I should uh, say at this point already that this is a mapping which is uh, actually unitary isomorphism from L2 of the capital pi onto the vector valued L2. Um, um, so the, this eta variable is here, and for each eta we have a function in uh, capital L2 of the periodic cell. So this Floquet transform is a unitary isomorphism, I mean a uh, bijection which is an isomorphism, isometry, um, and isomorphism in the Hilbert space sense from L2 of capital pi onto this vector valued um, capital L2 space. So if G is in here, and then uh, the inverse transform is according to that, that formula here. Um, so it's, this is understood as a Fourier series, you fix this one, and, and uh, this is a Fourier series representation of a function of eta, and how do you calculate the Fourier coefficients? Then this gives the inverse formula, uh, and in our setting, Um, so, you take uh, the values of G, okay, uh, G, uh, the X values are always only in the periodic cell, but this X here is living in the uh, full domain, so you have to bake this into the first periodic cell, and uh, you do it by um, subtracting the integer part from the first coordinate of X, and then you have X2 and eta, and you integrate over uh, eta. That's the formula for the inverse transform. So, okay, I already wrote G is in this space here. Now, um, um, uh, there is another variant of Locate transform where you add here uh, in to the exponent uh, the first coordinate x1. But now my um, purpose is to go to the world of analytic functions, and if you take that variant of the Floquet transform, this is standard, um, you don't anymore get, an you lose analyticity, because uh, you would separate the first and second coordinate, and then there is uh, no analytic, I mean, instead of that we would have E uh, minus I eta M plus X1, if I, yeah, and, and uh, this is useless in the, um, in regards of analytic functions because, I mean, if you compare this formula and, and my definition over there, uh, on the right hand side you still keep the analyticity and also in this, um, okay, the, the thing that this gives an analytic function on the um, full periodic domain is one of the results of my paper. Uh, maybe you cannot see it directly from here, but I will explain later. Why, 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 uh, why, why these things work? Okay. Um, how much is there? I already used 15 minutes, so um, I should probably speak something about the use of and motivation of this. But um, it's highly motivated in applications 
uh, in, in spectral theory, um, in, in elliptic spectral problems. And if I have time, I will probably return to that, but maybe it's better to proceed with the main thing. I mean, um, uh, I mean going to the setting of Bergman spaces. So all of this here is uh, nothing but um, a reformulation of uh, the general definition of Locke transform um, uh, just by using the complex variable. You see this definition here and what I wrote here uh, are the same. Once um, z is um, identified with, uh, with this vector x. Yes, and um, here I just mentioned that we have uh, this um, uh, unitary property uh, between L2 spaces. So uh, the next uh, simple idea is to restrict the Floquet transform to the Bergman space. And uh, then what happens? Well, it's still certainly well-defined transform because we are just taking the subspace. Uh, and and uh, But then uh, the question is, uh, it should be mapping onto something. First guess would probably be that you just replace this by the corresponding uh, Bergman space on, on the periodic cell. Uh, but then uh, if you do that, uh, you don't get a surjection because um, um, uh, the point is that um, if, you, if you imagine that f is in the beginning a smooth function, say c infinity, then um, it happens that, and, and uh, we will see this on the next slide, on um, at uh, the ends, um, I mean this uh, part of the boundary of the periodic cell, um, the function on the right hand side of this formula satisfies a quasi-periodic boundary condition. And um, in the L2 setting, it does not show up because um, for L2 functions, uh, I mean the boundary is uh, a subset of uh, meso zero. So a boundary condition here I wouldn't, uh, it, it would not have meaning. But now we are talking then next uh, about analytic functions. And um, um, okay, I will show. This will uh, be the next main theorem. Uh, I want uh, to have uh, an isomorphism onto, a surjective isomorphism on some, onto something, and this space A2, which I denote by A2 eta, um, it's not the full space, it's not the full uh, uh, Bergman space A2 um, on small pi. Um, to define it, Oh, oh, I mean, still uh, in the case of Bergman space, boundary values don't uh, directly make sense. Uh, Bergman functions uh, do not, in general, have well-defined boundary values. But um, still, I go to a smaller space, which is denoted by A2 eta x. And this is um, a space of analytic functions on a small omega, uh, which are which can be extended as analytic functions in the neighborhood of small omega. I mean, in a neighborhood uh, which is contained still in, in, in uh, the capital pi. So the functions a to eta have uh, extensions also ana as analytic functions into some neighborhoods here, including which include these uh, boundaries, lateral boundaries of the cell. And then uh, it makes sense to put this quasi-periodic boundary condition, which is very important. Uh, it's here. It depends on eta. Now eta is fixed for a moment. And for such functions, this boundary condition makes sense. And then A to eta is the closure of that subspace with respect to the Bergman norm, A to small pi. So it is uh, 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 defined here. And it is not, this space is not the full space. <coughs> because um, if you have, um, if you, for example, take for example the case eta is equal to zero, this means that the functions are periodic with respect to, to the real variable. And it's not true that you can approximate an arbitrary uh, Bergman function on the periodic cell by a periodic function which is periodic here, because uh, the Bergman norm 
means um, some restriction for the derivative. Uh, so, also, um, okay, that's the definition of locate transform. Um, and um, this is uh, this is the vector valued um, L two space uh, where the eta variable on is, is on this interval and for each eta the value is a function in that space. It's actually a one vector bundle if you want, but um, you can understand the definition of this space. So it's not exactly true that for every eta we get an analytic function here. Um, I will. Uh, but it is true for almost all eta. Um, I will, at the end, uh, explain this remark a little bit in more detail. Anyway, the main theorem here at this point says that the Floquet transform um, is uh, mapping from here onto that. And uh, the inverse transform then uh, is, is given by the previous formula which I wrote in the complex formulation. I mean this formula here. Right. Um, okay. It um, to prove all of this means some work, and I suppose it would already be worth some small paper. But um, then uh, the question is if it is of any use, and uh, I try to say um, uh, I think we can get some information of the Bergman kernel with these methods once we proceed. Um, okay. So now, uh, I, okay. I did not prove, of course. I did not go into the proof of the previous theorem. I will say something of that if I have time. Uh, but um, we know that now that uh, this Bergman space is isomorphic with uh, this space here. And um, I try to use it um, um, in order to clarify the Bergman kernel on the periodic domain. So it might be a good idea to consider this projection P eta from capital L2 of the periodic cell onto the, this Bergman subspace, the special Bergman subspace. And it turns out that it is, uh, well, I denote this orthogonal projection by P eta, and uh, it certainly also has a representation as an integral operator with kernel key, K eta. And um, so the question, is this related with the Bergman kernel of the full domain? Um, well, yes. Uh, this is the main theorem here at the bottom of the page. So um, the Bergman projection, original Bergman projection on the full domain, uh, it can be presented as a conjugation with uh, this uh, Bergman type projection, which I denote by beautiful P. I mean, uh, by using the Floquet transform. So here, uh, this uh, P beautiful is uh, a projection uh, related uh, to the small domain. And now I'm uh, saying here that um, you can write by using the Floquet transform um, the original projection with the help of this one. So uh, I didn't define what is actually the P beautiful, but it is you, you take this projection P eta um, and then uh, so this is uh, just uh, on, on that space L2 of small pi, but you remember we had uh, uh, these spaces, so it's, I think, a natural thing to define a projection from here onto here by doing it uh, for each eta uh, separately, uh, in a way point-wise, and, and then you get the projection P beautiful, um, and, and uh, that's a projection from here onto here, and um, then we have this connection here. And um, then uh, thinking about the kernels, um, the original kernel can be written as this kind of integral. So this is the, did I ever say that this is the integer part of that number? I hope it was clear, but uh, we have uh, this kind of uh, concrete formula which connects these two, pro two, two projections. 
Uh, I was thinking about the possibility to give the proof of this, but uh, I skip all proofs for the time being and just present the whole theory first. And uh, because um, so uh, this is another theorem which is probably worthwhile to mentioning in the literature. But uh, the next thing is um, that in the simply connected case. Uh, it's possible to um, calculate this kernel k eta and uh, then get a kind of formula for, for the original Bergman kernel in the full domain. So that's what I'm trying to explain next. So the uh, next object of interest is this kernel k eta from that domain onto uh, that space onto this one. And um, it will be found uh, by constructing an orthonormal basis in this space, which is a little bit um, surprising, perhaps, that one can do it. Well, it can be done up to some Riemann conformal mappings. Uh, the, the curious thing is that we still have this quasi-periodic boundary condition. So this is a little bit special space. space. Uh, so I think I will next show Okay, this was the proof of the previous theorem. I'm going to skip it and uh, let's have a look at this picture. Again, one artistic piece. Uh, sorry for all of those who like computer graphics, but I'm not good enough in that, so I just draw it and scan it. It's easier. Okay, so that's um, the periodic cell small omega. And what I'm going to do is uh, to apply two conformal mappings. So um, I don't directly map this to the disk, which would perhaps be the first idea which comes to mind, because of the quasi-periodic or periodic boundary conditions here. In, uh, instead, it's better to map this onto a doubly connected domain in such a way that uh, these are joined. Asking, okay, I mean, if you take this simple, basically exponential mapping with some scaling, you get uh, a conformal mapping from this domain onto um, this doubly connected domain. I mean, of course, it, uh, if you want the conformality, you have to slit it. And I put it in such a way that the slit is on the positive real axis, right? Uh, so um, if you slit this, then the interior of that domain is con conformally onto this and vice versa. With this exponential mapping, if you go from this direction uh, to there. Then um, use some classical complex analysis, which says that uh, this doubly connected domain can always be mapped onto the annulus conformally. That's uh, the classical conformal mapping theory, uh, theory. You can always map this doubly connected domain onto an annulus. And um, if you want, um, you can predetermine one of the radii of the annulus, but the other radius then would depend on your domain. You cannot control it, or you can control the ratio of these two radii. But anyway, um, there exists such a conformal mapping. And of course, if the boundary is exotic here, then this slit becomes something like an exotic curve here. But uh, it does, its shape does not count. What is important for the next is that this is a nice symmetric domain where, of course, the monomials, if it was just a Bergman space on this domain, you could uh, have an orthonormal basis on this domain just by taking the monomials, uh, I mean, the, the, the uh, integer powers. It's not that simple, but uh, not very much more complicated. Um, so let's keep in mind these two conformal mappings. I'm going to use them at the corresponding composition operators. Um, okay, here is just uh, uh, an explanation by words what I did. Um, so this mapping um, E is this exponential mapping which brings um, that domain onto the doubly connected domain and then another one from the doubly connected domain onto the annulus by mapping phi. Um, right, and, and uh, this composition operator here 
um, maps then the capital L2 space onto, on, on, on the periodic cell on some capital L2 space on the annulus, but you need to put a weight in order to get an isometric isomorphism. Uh, the weight uh, is described here. There appears actually two conformal mappings here. Uh, the weight is actually a modulus of an analytic function. Right. Also, the same composition operator maps our exotic space, this rather exotic uh, Bergman space, A to eta on the periodic cell, onto some Bergman type space on the annulus, slit annulus, actually. This slit denotes this curve, which uh, it may be complicated. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, uh, this composition operator is an is actually a unitary isomorphism in this space. And perhaps a little bit surprisingly, uh, although this weight here looks a little bit complicated, one can still uh, define an orthonormal basis in that space, and that's the point. It's, uh, the basis is, is described here. As I said, you take monomials, but now, because of the weight, uh, there appears uh, some uh, fractional powers, which depend on this uh, Floquet okay parameter eta also. Anyway, uh, it's not too complicated to show that these functions form an orthonormal basis on that space. And once you have this orthonormal basis here, you certainly have the orthogonal projection from here onto here. And then we go back uh, by using these conformal mappings and uh, we can get um, um, actually information on the kernel. All right. A lot of calculations and details at this point. I will proceed a little bit uh, here. We had, uh, now I'm looking at this orthogonal projection on the, on the spaces, on the space, uh, on the annulus. And we had the orthogonal basis. There has to be some trick with the weight, but it is very straightforward. Uh, this is um, the kernel of it. There is still one trick because in order to make sense of the calculations, um, now I'm sure there may be a little bit, I'm probably a little bit too fast, but um, for, for in order to continue with the calculations, I want to commute these two conformal mappings. So I want to commute uh, the mapping phi with the exponent function in this way. And it turns out that it's always possible to find another conformal mapping phi and with small phi so that this formula holds and actually it turns out that this co mapping small phi can be extended as a conformal mapping um, from from the periodic domain onto a strip. Um, so this formula looks complicated but uh, anyway the result is that uh, I have constructed the kernel as an infinite series from from that space onto that space. So I applied again uh, this composition operators to get this formula. Um, okay. This uh, theorem is only a repetition of the it's exactly the same what, which was on the previous slide. Um, now um, some calculations which uh, I, I felt very amusing when I was first time able to complete them. Because you remember, we had this one of the first theorems which combined the kernel of the general projection on the periodic domain with the kernel k eta. I employ it and um, then um, we get this formula here. Um, for the kernel, because, uh, well, uh, of course there are a lot of calculations, but um, I don't want to browse back a dozen of uh, slides to show the formula, but maybe you remember uh, uh, that uh, there was an integral of this type, anyway, in, in this formula, an integral from minus pi to pi of the variable eta. 
eta is here. And in addition, now there is a summation of this n. You combine this eta here and the n integration over the bounded interval with the summation over all integers, you end up with an integral over the whole real line. It's here. So you can write this kernel formula in that form. And then you look at it, it's just a Fourier transform. I mean, this is a Fourier variable t, uh, and this is a Fourier transform of that function here. Evaluate it at this complicated point, but basically this is just a Fourier transform of this function, which is actually t times the hyperbolic cosecant. Do you remember from elementary analysis what is hyperbolic cosecant? <laughs> um, I mean, uh, you, I never learned that when I was a student. I don't know if, how do you teach elementary analysis and special functions here and trigonometric functions, but it's, it's just some hyperbolic function. Uh, um, actually, actually, this function here, nothing more complicated. And uh, it took some time to take, to find its Fourier transform. Eventually, I, I, browsed, I, I tried some symbolic calculators uh, and, and it was too tough for them. Eventually, one of them, I don't remember which it was, but it was able to, to, to make the, uh, calculate the Fourier transform of this function t times the hyperbolic cosecant. Uh, but uh, I found the, uh, um, the solution, uh, this, this in some very old uh, uh, book of integral tables, which was published probably before the Second World War. Uh, it, the, anyway, the, the Fourier transform of this function is um, basically the square of hyperbolic second with, of course, a lot of parameters here. Uh, and this was a uh, uh, very amusing calculation. And uh, that's the final result. Uh, I have a formula here for, for the Bergman kernel on the full domain. I mean, not completely explicit, but uh, it's in terms of this conformal mapping phi. And this conformal mapping phi was just um, the conformal mapping from the doubly connected, general doubly connected domain onto the annulus. So uh, one can go that far. So uh, this is uh, just uh, um, another function related to that conformal mapping. Uh, the, okay, this conformal mapping was this capital phi, this is the derivative, and this was a kind of a conjugate of, of that mapping. So, um, and, and, uh, then, of course, uh, a strip, I mean, you put a straight line here instead of that uh, broken line. Uh, it, this is a special case of a um, periodic domain, and um, for that, uh, the Bergman kernel is known, of course. You can, you can find it, uh, for example, in a book of Kranz, Stephen Kranz. It's mentioned, and you can calculate uh, by conformal mappings yourself if you, if you want. And uh, that's... Um, the Bergman kernel for the strip, and uh, if you take uh, that case and the simple conformal mapping in that case, which is the identity function, actually, you end up with the same thing. So, uh, to be honest, uh, there was some small errors in my calculations, and it took uh, some hours of calculation to, to check the calculation and uh, put all the constants in such a way that I can perfectly the correct formula. But it's nice because uh, it's it's uh, a way to check that uh, the calculations are correct. So this does not happen too many times in abstract analysis, but this time it was okay. All right. So what next? I hope you find this already a kind of an application. Um, okay. One more word. Unfortunately, what then was a big disappointment for me was that. Uh, Using uh, directly this uh, conformal mapping phi, it's possible to derive this formula without going to the theory of Locke transform, which is, of course, I shouldn't have revealed this, but uh, it's a fact that one cannot hide eventually, so I have to say that. Um, okay, some applications, be because there is now some new information on the kernel, so if you want to. Uh, as I said, uh, once you have uh, information on the kernel, it's possible then to derive boundedness uh, estimates for other norms. So, uh, for example, 
if uh, you put a weight on the periodic domain which uh, satisfies this uh, requirement, which is uh, rather general, I would say. Uh, so I think uh, polynomial increasing weights, for example, would satisfy this. And then uh, it, uh, it's possible to show that um, the Bergman projection operator is still bounded with respect to the corresponding weighted LP norm for any finite P. Okay. So I think there is still some time, maybe some proofs. Um, okay, what is this? Um, I want to show that um, I don't anymore have the full Floquet okay, transform formula, but it is roughly speaking here. You just put here the variable z, and here too, then you have it. And, uh, and, and imagine that your function f is uh, in, in A2, and a Bergman function. And I said uh, that um, this function here, which is given by the Floquet transform, it is function on, on, on the periodic cell. Uh, it's actually uh, analytic for almost all eta, but uh, not necessarily for all eta, precisely. So simple example, uh, when this fails, you take the strip for the periodic domain. So uh, this periodic cell is, I mean, the imaginary direction is between, uh, I mean, it's just bounded away from zero. It's uh, from one quarter to one half. And uh, I mean, in this case, the simple function 1 over z is analytic on, on capital pi and it's also in A2 because if you take uh, the modulus of this squared it's um, roughly the real part 1 over the real part modulus of the real part squared so it is certainly integrable over over this strip so this is a nice Bergman function and um, um, this log transform uh, behaves as the harmonic series because um, okay so so this is the log transform actually it's it's shown here two square root of two pi times the log transform is, is precisely this sum and if you want to sum you have to consider these points and uh, here I make a simple estimate if you take this f at the point c plus m and subtract from one over m, it is of the order 1 of m squared. So you put this estimate, or, or you, you write this, I mean, you take eta equal to 0 here. Ah, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's the point. Then uh, the value is this one, and you get uh, basically the harmonic series plus this error, which is of order 1 over m of 2, m, m squared. Um, so, because this co diverges and the other one converges, uh, this sum diverges, and, and uh, so you don't have an analytic function for eta equals zero. But of course, if eta is non-zero, then you have an oscillating factor here, and uh, you get an analytic function. So, simple example. Yes. Um, then. Maybe we can have a quick look uh, at the proof of one of the basic main theorems. I mean, this was, uh, of course, uh, going back to the basics of this theory. Um, of course, uh, uh, important theorem. Uh, the Floquet transform maps the Bergman space onto exactly this um, vector valued space. Uh, why is it on two? Uh, I try to explain it. Um, Uh, sorry, here is a misprint. Uh, the proof is in several steps. Uh, I should. Sh I'm, I'm showing here that it maps the Bergman space into that space. Uh, okay, this is the first step. So, um, to see this, um, uh, let's make the observation that um, um, if you take an arbitrary Bergman function, 
you can approximate it with functions uh, like that. I take phi sub epsilon to be this uh, Gaussian type function. And of course, now uh, the domain is um, bounded uh, in, in uh, the imaginary direction. So this, um, at infinity, this decays very fast, even for any epsilon. Uh, because it basically the Gaussian function, the imaginary factor, the imaginary component does not play a role. So, um, and, and on the other hand, if epsilon goes to zero, this approximates f in, in capital L A2. Uh, of course, this requires a small proof, but that is a fact. Um, <coughs> so I make a subspace x of functions of this form, and it is a dense subspace. So, now, if you take a Floquet transform of such function, it's basically this thing here. Now, the, the problem might be that the convergence is bad, but now you have a function which decays uh, Gauss in the Gaussian way, even in the infinity, so these terms become very small. And, uh, of course, a single term here has um, it's, it's a very nice function because, at least uh, in the neighborhood of the periodic cell, uh, because it is actually analytic in the whole, whole, whole periodic domain. So, um, I mean, because of this Gaussian decay, this very fast the decay, it follows that uh, if you take the Floquet transform of such a function, then it has uh, certainly um, an analytic extension to a neighborhood of... Uh, of, of uh, this periodic cell. And then uh, you also have well-defined boundary values, and this simple calculation shows that for such a function, we have this quasi-periodic boundary condition. It, it follows from the, the definition of the Floquet transform. Um, and um, this means that uh, Floquet transform maps this uh, subspace X into that subspace where we, this was a um, uh, this space was uh, the one uh, such that functions have an um, extension to a neighborhood of uh, small pi and uh, satisfy the quasi-periodic boundary condition. We, we have just uh, uh, realized that. And uh, that is a subspace of, of this space. And uh, this is a banner space, actually, Hilbert space. Hilbert space complete and f is an isometry, it, it uh, implies that because x is dense in here, then um, this must be mapped into that space. So we have the proof for that. Then uh, why should that be a surjection? So we again so start to work in the other direction. Now, I take again this A2 eta x uh, subspace of uh, nice functions with quasi-periodic boundary condition uh, and, and uh, take the vector valued version uh, denoted by h sub eta. And then uh, instead of taking a general function um, onto that uh, space with A2 eta, I take a function in this space. Uh, denoted by G, and now I should construct a, an analytic function on the full domain. Um, I define, okay, here is another misprint, this uh, index M is missing here. Um, I take a fix this M. Okay, so the function, the function should be analytic in the full domain, so I have to think about an arbitrary uh, translated um, subdomain. I, so I fix this M. And uh, on that subdomain I define the function via this formula. And um, I just claim, now I have a sequence of analytic functions defined here, and so this is GM, and here is GM plus 1, and so on. And I claim that um, actually here on this uh, so these both are defined here. Uh, these two analytic functions actually coincide on this line. And then, of course, I can make it into a single analytic function on the full, full periodic domain. And this becomes, okay, uh, I don't have 
anymore very much time. But um, I take a Z which is uh, um, contained precisely on, on uh, this uh, common joining uh, line segment. And uh, after this calculation, which basically uses of only this, no, I don't use the quasi periodic. I, I I use the quasi periodic boundary condition for G, of course, in order to make this um, calculation go through, and, uh, and and the definition of these functions, and we end up with that uh, these two functions go inside for such Z. Now I have two, co two analytic functions, as I said, one here and one here, and they go inside on this. So, so um, this means I can uh, uh, define one analytic function. Uh, so, I mean, these two analytic functions then go inside not only on this segment, but on, on, on the common um, domain of definition, and uh, so it's possible to extend this as a function in the full domain, because this can be done for all n. Uh, that gives... Oh, run out of... Okay. Ah, yeah, very good. Um, that gives uh, the analytic function, which I denote by g eta. And uh, then... Um, this uh, rest of the proof is um, just to show that uh, this function must actually be, I mean, um, let's see, um, this is um, um, let's see, okay, 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 this is this is the function g eta, it still be, uh, depends on eta, but uh, then I need to show that uh, given this function small g, um, the inverse Floquet transform of small g is, is uh, uh, gotten from the function capital G, and uh, uh, it follows by comparing the definition of the inverse Floquet transform and the definition of the function g eta. Oh yeah, okay, I forgot this intermediate step at the end. Uh, the g eta, of course, it was a function which depends on eta, and we have to construct um, um, an inverse image to, for the function small g. Um, and uh, that's done by taking this uh, formula, uh, integrating g eta with respect to eta. Then we get uh, the inverse image for the function g eta. And, and the proof of the fact that it is inverse image follows from the definition of, of the inverse Floquet transform. All right, so I hope um, this at least somehow explained uh, why this quasi-periodic boundary condition appears into these considerations. Uh, the final next slide. Uh, uh, it's not very important, but um, there was the claim of um, the unitarity of this mapping, but it is of course clear from the general theory because um, the Floquet transform is no, known to be unitary mapping, so it's just a restriction to subspaces and uh, that's clear, but uh, there was an explanation that it can be also shown by the calculation. And uh, on the last slide, which is not shown here, I am thanking you for the attention and that's all what I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, are there questions or remarks or some clarification or suggestion? Okay. Yes. Can I ask a little curiosity? When you look to this theorem you have there about there are some more things using the block the block transform between this A2 of pi, capital pi, and this a2 of pi 2 with values in the other space. Yeah. Is it possible to describe the pre-image of the program uh, of the H2 of the, you see, you look to the subspace there and look for the pre-image. What, what are the Berman functions on the domain such that 
you go to the space which is also holomorphic on the on the variable on the on the, on the, on the variable eta. You understand my question? So you, you look to the subspace H2 of minus pi pi with values in the Hebel space and look at the pre image by the pro pro eta. Try to identify what it, what it could be. This is a curiosity. Uh, I never thought about that. Do you understand what I am asking or not? So more or less. Yes. So if you look to the space L2 of the of the Yeah, and you, you replace L2 by hard space. Yes, this I want to go back. But ah. Yes, this is what I want. That never came to my mind. Yeah, but this is, looks to be some special class of holomorphic functions because it would be this is a I don't know what it would be. Yes, um, uh, this, uh, you want to admit analyticity somehow. There would be something in the, there is, um, I mean, the theory in, in LT equations, it's, uh, there is a um, very fundamental book by Peter Kutschman, which is a little difficult to read, but he deals with this analyticity aspect in all possible ways and maybe it is there but I can uh, I, I never thought about this okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.